You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the best in paranormal talk radio in the UK and around the world. Hello, world. You're listening to Eleanor Wagner's Strange and Scary World here on the Paranormal UK Radio Network, where we're always creeping it real. I'm your host, Eleanor Wagner. Please join me in welcoming today's guest, author, researcher, and musician, Joshua Cutchin. Hi, Joshua. Hi, it's so nice to be here. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely welcome. I'm glad that uh, our mutual acquaintance, Josh, from What Lurks Beneath, put us in touch. Yeah. And yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation. We were talking about strange and scary phenomena, and he mentioned to me that you had some really great knowledge about fairies and it just lightened up my mind i was like oh my gosh because i have this elderly gentleman he's like 86 years old Mm -hmm. and i don't even know if i told you this but he loves to take his dog for walk and go and check out the deer in his neighborhood and he's great with the camera but i also think he's very sensitive to spirit and to the unknown and he catches things that are just crazy and he gets excited and he messages me and sends me these pictures. Do you see this? Do you see that? And this one picture he sent me looked like this little leprechaun guy hanging out with the deer. And he says, this thing lives in this field. And he says, I see it all the time. And see, now, now I want to see this picture. <laughs> I will definitely send it to you once I'm all settled in. I will send you the picture and you have a look at it because it is crazy cool. And that's kind of what put that first thought in my mind because now that I've been doing this for about five years or so, I'm talking to all these people via the podcasting, and I realize there's a lot more out there that we're not aware of. I, I feel like my scope was this. It, it Absolutely. Like this. Yeah, you, you start with something simple. It gets its foot in the door, you know? So it's sort of like, well, yeah, I think that maybe ghosts are possible. And then you look into that, and things start to snowball, and eventually you wind up at something as frankly patently silly as as fairies and fae folk yeah. which you, you know when people discuss these topics that's kind of a punchline that people use they're like well they saw a ufo it's not like he said he saw a leprechaun and for me it's <laughs> for me it's like well you know this, there's such a long extensive history here and a very strong argument to be made that a lot of the a lot of modern ufo encounters are actually sort of variations on these older fairy stories so it, you start to say, well, maybe there is something, something to this. So yeah, it's it that that's a that I've I've heard of a lot of people who've had that sort of similar journey, myself included, to a degree. Why don't we start with how you got involved and how you got started? So I was always a uh, <clears throat> I was always a monster kid. You know, anytime there was a creature feature on TV, I would be watching that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and naturally, that sort of I think spills over into. You know, the unknown, the unexplained, those sort of things. So for the longest time, my, my primary interest, you know, was Bigfoot. It wasn't until years later that I discovered that my father actually was a subscriber to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization newsletter. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, maybe there's something hereditary here. Um, but yeah, but you know, I grew up in a household that never told me that I couldn't look into these sort of things. You know, it was, you know, it, there's sort of an attitude that as long as I had a book in my hand, at least I was reading, and that's a good thing. And be receptive to everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, even though I grew up in a Christian household, there weren't any religious barriers to any of this stuff or anything like that. Same. Same. So, yeah, uh, which is, you know, a refreshing take that I don't feel like I hear a lot from young religious families nowadays, but that's neither here nor there. Very well, very well. Um, Anyway, so, you know, ghosts kind of were a little bit passe for me. I've had some ghost-ish experiences in my past. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, yeah, of course. You know, that was sort of my attitude regarding that. The Bigfoot thing, I was on this sort of train of thought that Bigfoot might be a giant undiscovered primate. Uh, my, my thinking has shifted in that regard significantly, but um, we'll, we'll put that aside for the time being. I was very much skeptical on the UFO question because if you look at, you know, even a cursory reading of the sighting reports that have happened over the past 70 years, and arguably the UFO question has been in the background for much, much longer than that. But if you look at just the past 70 years, it seems to paint a picture of multiple civilizations coming here with, in like, you know, hundreds of different styles of craft and 
an equal number of configurations, everything from little short fairy dwarves to giant <laughs> robot people. And it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, I can buy the A species is visiting here, but you know, what are the odds are there are so many different species visiting here. So I ended up finally coming around to the UFO possibility and really entertaining it as something that might have an objective basis, probably around the year 2015. And that was the year, sorry, 2012, actually, because 2015 was when I left my job. <laughs> but uh, 2012 was 2012 was when I got a job and I had a an hour long commute to and from work. And I started listening to podcasts and I, you know, having always had a little bit of an interest in this stuff, I started listening to some paranormal podcasts and they introduced me to the possibility that some of these things that people encounter are not necessarily in- being encountered in this reality. They're occurring. Those experiences are unfolding in an altered state of consciousness that's allowing us to see into another world. And for that me, for me, that was a very parsimonious way to sort of explain the variations that you see across these different sightings, because if, if they somehow are interacting with our minds, then they could literally appear like anything they want to. Right. And, you know, there's some indications through their various folklores that something like that is going on. So I started being more open to the UFO question and my interest kept on growing. And I had a, I think it was a Christmas, it was either a Christmas gift or a birthday gift. That was an Amazon card from my sister-in-law. And I decided that I was going to get a Bigfoot book and I got a wonderful Bigfoot book, uh, J. Robert Alley's Raincoast Sasquatch. It's all about sightings that happen on the coast of Alaska. And uh, I recall reading in there that there is a bit of folklore among some of the tribes that one of their Bigfoot analogs, uh, the Bequess, it's believed that if you accept food from the Bequess, number one, it isn't really food at all. It looks like salmon, but it's actually dried tree bark. And number two, if you accept this food from the Bequess and you eat it, you'll be trapped with the Bequess forever. And that was when something triggered in the back of my mind. And I don't know why this detail always stood out to me, but it did. There's this long-standing prohibition in the fairy folklore of Western Europe that if you take food in fairyland, you're destined to be stuck there in fairyland forever. And <laughs> it was so confronting to me to see that bit of folklore juxtaposed against indigenous folklore in Alaska, which is it's ba- it's practically the same, you know, prohibition. It's practically the same taboo. What accounts for that? And you know, I came to the to the uh, conclusion that. It had to be one of several things. It had to be either the least exotic, which I still find really fascinating, is that there is a sort of Jungian collective unconscious, this this well of motifs that we draw upon regardless of where we are in the world, which is a fascinating idea in and of itself. Or there was a lot more exchange of culture between the old and new worlds prior to Columbus or the Vikings. Or that these things have an objective reality all of their own, that people are coming up with these similar rules and things about interacting with this other world because they've all experienced it firsthand. So I, any, any three of those is is absolutely fascinating to me as, as a possibility. And I said, well, someone should write a book on that. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I got a desk job at, at the University of Georgia at the time and jumping into this field is not something one does lightly um, because I, I dare say it makes you times are changing and this is not necessarily the case now, but it is new, right? It, yeah, it does. It does. It's sort of, changing, but yeah, it sort sort of makes you unhirable. There are some, um, yeah. Yeah. there were some, there were some job interviews that I progressed through about three or four rounds. And then I think they finally decided to Google me. <laughs> and it was like, Oh, he's a, he's a kook. <laughs> um, but I just I, I felt a calling to put together my first book, which was a Trojan Feast, which looked specifically at this sort of food taboo as it as it appears in different cultures, and it really is widespread amongst every inhabited continent. Uh, people have this idea that if you go to, you know, the other world, whatever that might be, spirit world, underworld, the uh, astral <laughs> realm, heavenly world, wherever, where right. whenever you go to this other reality don't eat or drink anything. And, you know, I still find that fascinating that that's such a pervasive myth, but I wrote my first book on that topic and it was well received to my absolute shock. There were folks whose books that I read in middle school who were saying kind things about the Trojan feast. Yeah. That must have, that must have like tugged at your heartstrings, right? Because these yeah. two were actually accepting you and giving you good feedback. I could not have hoped for 
a better and warmer reception. And it was kind of like being a basketball fan and kind of enjoying basketball, but not knowing you had any aptitude. And all of a sudden, you know, LeBron's like, hey, good job, kid. It's like, oh, what? Wow! Did you really say that to me? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm still I'm still in shock at like uh, sometimes I look through my phone and some of the names of people that I count as friends now, not just acquaintances, but friends, kind of shocks me. Uh-huh. It's been a wonderful trip. Right. So yeah, uh, I ended up quitting my job and just working as an author and a musician. And eight years later, it's finally become profitable. <laughs> it took a while, but it's finally become. It happens. I've been writing since I was a kid, and I actually wrote my first book before I had children, so this is way back. And then when they were full grown and on their own, I decided to publish it, and all of a sudden it took off. And you know how you always have that time in that place, the universe has it for you when they want to do it, and and you just have to go with it. Well, well, my career started when I was 50, and you know, being an author, it's a struggle just getting your book out there. Whether you see a profit or not is one thing, but it's the joy of writing and getting that story out. That's the other. Right. And, and that's so all I like. That's I do it like for the it, yeah. joy of it. I do it for the sheer joy of it. And the Absolutely. Love of it. I, I try to emphasize this to folks because I, I, I run into people who are trying to chase trends and it's, that's never been my guiding ethos. I mean, I write these, I write books for myself and I do projects for myself. I have been fortunate enough that people want to come along for the for the ride. I just, but what I do is I try to make it the highest quality that it can be, even though it's just for me. And right. people seem to want to share in that journey. Now here we are. Keep on doing it, then. Yeah. So here we are. Depending on how you count, seven or eight books later. <laughs> and yeah, that's yeah. great. Well, when I when I first started writing my first book, it was a psychological thriller, and that's where my my thing was. I mean, I was always into Stephen King and Dean Koontz and John Saul. That was the stuff I read. And then I went to school to write for children. So you, you think I had to write a children's book along the way. But I never really thought that I was going to end up writing true account hauntings. But my joy was always in that phenomenon when I was a kid. It was all about ghosts and creature mm-hmm. feature like you said and in yep. Sergio. That was my thing. So the universe had a plan and I just needed to wait to find out. And before I knew it, I was writing books on true account hauntings in the community where I live. But what I wanted to share with you, which was a little story, it was going to just be ghost stories, true account ghost stories in the neighborhood. And then when I put it out on social media, all these people came to me with stories about Bigfoot in my community and UFOs. And there were such good stories, I could not leave them out. So rather than it just be Sussex County hauntings, I did Sussex County hauntings and other strange phenomena. So I could put those stories in, which turned out to be a really good thing because now it's enabled me to write about uh, the UFOs and Bigfoot and other things like near-death experience and reincarnation. And now I'm talking to you about fairies. So, yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm sure you've noticed this because this is this is where my my greatest interest, if we want to get really niche, sort of originates. Is the more you look into this stuff, the more porous these boundaries become between these phenomena. You know, you have Bigfoot stories that sound like. A ghost story because the thing just winks out of out of sight and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, you know, you have people who uh, who see dead loved ones in alien abductions or see a UFO and their house fills with poltergeist activity, and it starts to appear as if a lot of these boundaries that we draw between these different phenomena are sort of arbitrary. And that's that's sort of if if I if I had to speak highly of myself, which I am always hesitant to do, but if I had to, I'd. I have to say that I, I try to be a disrupting force uh, and, and say, hey, let's mix all this stuff up. And then you can see like how it might be that we're looking at w- multiple facets of one bigger picture, one bigger reality. And, you know, the, 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 the fairy folk stuff, I think to a certain degree, an argument could be made that it's one of the underlying substrata of these things. In addition to consciousness, as I alluded to earlier, a lot of stuff falls within that theory umbrella that we've been... I don't think I don't think willingly. I don't think it's a sinister agenda, but we've been deprived of how truly powerful that body of folklore is because we have this idea of what fairies are in popular culture being these sweet little vixens with wings, and that's not really what's indicated in the folklore. If you if you go back, not even that far. You're sinister, or the uh, idea of you know fairies in our current form that we think of them. And being sweet little things is pretty much a, a, an Elizabethan idea. 
In fact, you can't really find depictions of fairy wings much earlier than some of the stagings of Shakespeare's plays. There are a couple of references in poetry, but if you actually go back and look at the folk tales in Western Europe, they not only lack wings, they've always been attributed powers of levitation and flight and things like that, but they also were not always you know, short and tiny. Sometimes they would appear just as tall as a human being. Oh, really? Yeah, and a lot of these terms are are really fluid. That's something else that you quickly discover. You know, elves, trolls, fairies, mermaids, giants, they kind of all fall under that generalized fairy umbrella. But there's always this, this you know, this assumption that fairies being shapeshifters can be whatever size they dang well please. And then the other thing that I find really fascinating about it is if you look, you know, we we normally think of fairies as being, though. Know, English, Scottish, Irish, you know, that's, that's sort of the term. Yeah. And and then, you know, if, if we, if we, if we want to say elves, then we're looking into Scandinavia and that sort of, you know, region and, you know, Germany with dwarves. But what you find out is that after looking at this long enough, I would hazard a guess that any region in the world that has, that has people, there is some culture that has stories of beings who tend to not exclusively, and there are variations on this, but beings who tend to live on the margins of society, have supernatural powers, tend to be short, often dwell underground, and are fond of kidnapping human beings, sometimes replacing them with changelings. Yeah, so I mean, like, it, 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 you know, it, it's no more it's no more stark for me than if you look at some of the um, the Cherokee myths and legends from here in in the New World, and and it gets so specific that. I have to ask myself if there might be cultural contamination from some of these early ethnographers because it is so specific. Sometimes I read a story and the only thing differentiating it from a story in Ireland is just the proper nouns. (laughs) You know, there's this belief that time would fluctuate in the presence of fairies in Ireland. And you see the same story among the uh, Yunwi Sunsi or the uh, Nanyanahi here in here in uh, the southeastern United States, there are these ideas that they are associated with earthworks, sometimes burial mounds, and that's something you certainly see in the old world, and you also see down here in, in the southeastern United States. And again, there's that question, like, if there wasn't any cultural exchange between these two populations in pre-Columbian times, then why is why do, the, why do these things look so darn similar? There is a sinister aspect to fairies, but I, I like to call them more capricious. You know, it's, it's strange that because you have uh, Disney is very <laughs> known to portray everything as to just so wonderful and glorious and the mermaids, and so people get this this perception, and then it's not a reality. And then you find out that the original fairy tales they were killing people and not loving people. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's sort of the same sanitization that you see if you go back and actually read Brothers Grimm. <clears throat> you know, you can see that sort of same sort of uh, cotton candy <laughs> facade yeah. put on things. Yeah, but you know, there was this there was this idea that um, you know time would dilate in this other realm. They could be forces for good or forces for I wouldn't even say evil again. I'd say just uh, negative forces. Negative. You know, if, if you if you kept your fairy that was associated with your household, maybe it was a brownie or a a French goblin or something. If if you kept them appeased with offerings and you treated them kindly and didn't speak ill of them, they could bring you great fortune. And if you even accidentally offended them, then your life would fall apart. And this could be this could be something as relatively innocuous as cutting down the wrong tree, you know. Or even you know, there's a story from uh, the Isle of Man where somebody ran into a fairy tree, just like happened to brush into one, and you know, I think they were stricken blind in that particular story. And so. Yeah, it's they, they are not to be trifled with, and they are unpredictable. Again, capricious is is the adjective that I like to use. But exactly what they were and what they are, you know, a lot of our modern conceptions of fairies. Again, using that as an umbrella term to encompass things like gnomes and elves and sprites and all this. Right. Our modern conception of fairies really ties them to this sort of idea of like being earth elementals and helping vegetation grow and being you know stewards of nature at the bottom of the garden and while that's indicated to a degree in some of the folklore then we could get into if time permitting and interest permitting we can get into that but that is mostly an outgrowth of this uh late 
uh, 19th century spiritual movement known as theosophy, which you might have run into. It was uh, closely tied with the spiritualist movement, um, dealt with a lot of channeled material. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky was the leader of this organization. And it's from that tradition that we see this idea of fairies being elementals and inhabiting a flower and helping it grow. That's sort of where the roots of that sweeter version of fairies kind of originate. If you go back into the folklore, and again, this is a consistency that I voted, you find lots of connections between fairies, regardless of where, what continent you're looking at, and the human dead. Whether it is that you can die and become a fairy, or that you die and you go to the fairies, or <laughs> it, it's not entirely clear, and it's often you get some conflicting information in that regard, but some of the origins seem to be tied to the human dead. Some of the origins for fairies seem to be seem to suggest that they were demoted pagan spirits, or that they were you know smaller deities that were associated with individual areas as well, um, really specific spirits of place, you know, and then of course Christianity comes along and can't abide any degree of nuance in this regard. So, uh, you get these stories that become Christianized that, you know, oh, the fairies are demons, or you get these stories that, uh, fairies were the angels that were, uh, too good for hell and too bad for heaven, <laughs> or the fairies who happened to be on the outside of heaven when the gates were shut after the word heaven. I'm sorry. Oh, you have to put a title on it. You have to, you have to put a yeah. You have to put a label on it. This <laughs> this um this this compulsion that we all we all feel as human beings. My mentor Greg Bishop calls it uh, the certainty fetish. Like we have to be able to say this is what it is. That's probably been the most surprising thing about looking into the fairy folklore is how just messy it is. To the degree that you will talk to fairy scholars, and yes, those people do exist, and they will they themselves will tell you that. No one really knows where this sort of archetype of the fairy came from. It just sort of appears and is sort of back engineered to be to be one thing or another. Yeah. Hmm. I know this is a far out question, but you hear about all these missing people. Do you think they have something to do with? As you mentioned, kidnapping. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's a. <laughs> a lot of the missing four one one stuff. People who go missing in national parks. I've often said that. Missing 411 is a paranormal Rorschach test, you know, so whatever you're really interested in is what you're going to see. So you talk to somebody who's at the Bigfoot, it's like, oh, it's Bigfoot. You talk to somebody who's yeah. with those. So I realize, having made that statement, that there's a lot of irony in the fact that I would attribute most of that to fairy activity because I'm sort of outing myself in my own Rorschach <laughs> test. But, but at the same time, there are some specifics that I don't think any of the other explanations, if we're going to solve one unknown with another, with another unknown... There are some specifics to those cases that I think fit the fairy folklore model very well. Some of David Politis' work, he talks about how people sometimes, he's noticed a trend of them wearing bright clothing, perhaps the color red sometimes, before they disappear into these national parks. And I'll be darned if you don't look through some of that fairy folklore, they could be offended by certain loud clothing. And this was often region specific, but one of the clothing articles of clothing or colors of articles of clothing that they would be most offended by and be inclined to take you would be if you wore red. And, and again, in some, some other folklore in different parts of Europe, if you wore red, it could repel the fairies, but there's still this connection between bright clothing and, and disappearances. There's also, in, in those David Pilatus reports, these stories of, uh, you know, the, the search has to be shut down because the weather rolls in and it's a horrible storm that just sort of shuts down the operation. And I have trouble making, I have trouble coming up with a scenario where UFOs are controlling the weather or Bigfoot are controlling the weather, but theories have always been associated with storms. It's been one of their, one of their primary powers. So that, that. ticks what? another box. Yeah. Um, huh. One of the most fascinating things that I fascinating connections that I saw was, you know, a lot of these missing 411 stories, the uh, the person is sometimes found face down and they've got their clothing neatly stacked beside them, which is always a very eerie sort of thing to see. There was an article, uh, an academic article, I can't remember what journal it was, and nor can I remember the author, but I do have it cited in one of my books, that there are stories in Hawaii 
that if you run into the night marchers, who are not explicitly fairies, but sort of share a lot of the same attributes that you'd see with fairies in Europe, including this tendency to troop across the landscape on certain nights, if you were to encounter the night marchers, the one thing you should do to protect yourself is before their king walked by, you should strip yourself naked and lie face down on the ground. It's like, oh, okay. oh that's that's kind of crazy. So, so yeah, I, I do see a lot of a lot of similarities between these disappearances and the, and the faithful stuff, and. I think that it, it suggests some things. It suggests that these older phenomena, if they do have an objective reality, never really went away. They just sort of changed their, their appearance and their name. You know, I'm not sure that calling these things fairies is an accurate reading. You know, I think that we're using language to try to tack onto something to make it seem more comfortable to wrap our heads around. That. But, you know, the, the other thing that sort of becomes a problem, too, is that... The term fairy, again, just looking specifically at Western Europe, was applied to a lot of things much in the same way that we would just throw around the term paranormal or supernatural. So when you're looking back through these older books, it might not be as explicitly phenomena from the good folk or the gentry or the wee folk, whatever you want to call them, as much as it is just their language for describing something unexplained. No, it's fairy. You know. All that being said, though, I, I do see throughout a lot of the paranormal phenomena that we talk about, the thumbprint of this older folklore and this older mythology that just really refuses to go away no matter how much we try to keep reinventing the paranormal wheel. Mm. So we were talking about fairies, we were talking about Bigfoot, and then you you threw in gnomes and (laughs) all that other stuff. So there's a lot more than we realize, obviously. Yeah, or, you know, sometimes I entertain the idea that there's a lot less, more than we realize, but a lot less than we think. And and what I mean by that is that these are just masks that this other thing likes to switch out and put put on and take off. Stephen King book, for me. Well, you know, it's interesting. In Catherine Briggs's Encyclopedia of Fairies, which I have sitting over there in two pieces on my shelf because I've looked through it so much, She was a preeminent fairy scholar and and wrote several books on fairies. And there is an entry in her encyclopedia of fairies about a shape-shifting supernatural fairy that would appear just like your uh, deepest fears. And it was referred to as it. (laughs) So, yeah, that's that's another thing. Bloody. Yeah, oh, no, it's, it's, it's another thing that I'm fascinated with is is how we as a culture sort of laugh about fairies, but they are they're everywhere. Like you know, the, the, their influence is with us to this day in ways that we don't fully comprehend. I mean, you know, the medical term "stroke" is a derivation of of the fairy stroke, which would be when somebody was you know touched by a fairy, they would have the symptoms that we normally associate with a stroke nowadays. But that term literally comes from that older term for fairy no, stroke. That's yeah. Um, the color cobalt was originally associated with the underground mining fairies known as the cobalts. That's that's where the, oh, yeah. Cobalt. And you can just, the list goes on and on and on and on. These connections and other things in other ways. That's yeah. so interesting. It, it has not that's gone anywhere. It gets lost in, in history and gets lost amongst the mob of things that are around us. So take somebody like you to unearth it and put it out there. Well, it, it, these the, these older ways haven't gone anywhere. They've just sort of transformed and gone underground, I guess you could say. Mm. So suffice it to say, is fairies where your love lies or is it just about everything? I mean, it's it's just about everything. Although, you know, I keep on feeling this pull back to that older fairy folklore. I'm at the point now where I have difficulty differentiating the UFO experience from the fairy stuff. It's gotten so specific. So look, let's, so UFOs are probably about a dozen different explanations, right? Some mundane and some strange, but, but if you look at sort of the contact scenario with these beings, it's startlingly consistent. A lot of these parallels were first noted in public, you know, in a, in a public forum by a ufologist, Jacques Vallée in his 1969 book, Passport to Magonia. But, you know, I can say, I can make the following statements, both about modern UFO encounters or modern UFO occupants and fairies. Short beings 
presided over by a taller being in the leadership capacity, carrying wands capable of paralysis, causing missing time, traveling as lights through the sky associated with ancient structures and ancient sites of human habitation. <laughs> Have power, powers of levitation, powers to walk through walls. It gets so specific that huh. I could I could even say, you know, there's a common re recurring trope in the alien abduction community of having an implant, right? You know, I've got like, you know, they put something in my body that tr let, lets them track me or monitor me. I'm sure you've heard these stories. Oh, sure. There's a direct analog for this in, in Western Europe known as the fairy blast. And blast, in this sense, shares the same word root germanic word root as blustery and blister and this idea was that you could be hit with a fairy blast of wind especially if you defended the fairies and it would cause a blister on your skin and within this blister would be all sorts of anything it would just detritus right it would be a it might be a t piece of a twig or it might be a bit of bone or it might be a bit of porcelain or it might be a tooth or it might be hair but this idea that there's a foreign object put by supernatural forces in your body, you can see that in the fairy stuff too. So it's gotten to the point where I used to hedge my bets and say, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you find anything in you know the fairy folklore, there's an analog in the UFO stuff and vice versa. I'm pretty sure. But nowadays I'm like, I, I will be able to find something that even if you have to sort of tilt your head and squint <laughs> is, is a pretty close match. I mean, you've also got this extensive history of, you know, human alien hybrids and long before yeah, that yeah, was yeah. ever long before that was ever a, a discussion point, you had, you know, fairies taking children and uh fairies taking people to breed with them or people, you know, being taken away to the other world and coming back with a strange child that was had all these miraculous talents and gifts, much in the same way that the UFO community talks about star scenes and indigo children. So it's just it's gotten to the point where I just it's perhaps the most remarkable coincidence in the world or these two things are related even if there's not an objective reality to it it's the same impulse that we are reinventing with a 21st century veneer i think do the uh, black eyed children fit into the spectrum somewhere along so the black eyed children are something of a of a peculiarity i know some people who don't really like to treat them as authentic because the stories sort of seem to pop up relatively recently i'm a little bit more charitable in my assessment of it i see shades of the black-eyed children in the men in black which some people have uh, compared to uh to vampires in the way that they really? have yep. to be have to be invited inside right oh, but, right right so so once you make that connection black-eyed children to men in black to, to vampires then you're back into you're back into the fairy stream right because um a lot of the diseases that people would associate with vampirism like consumption tuberculosis etc they would associate that with vampires they'd also associate that with fairies both fairies and vampires couldn't cross running water both fairies and vampires specific fairies had to be invited in both can be repelled by certain objects often iron horseshoes in the case of fairies or crucifix or crosses in the, in the case of vampires so so there is a connection there my second book was all about supernatural smells it was called uh, the brimstone deceit and was looking at just the reports of smells and all sorts of supernatural and paranormal cases and trying to see if there was some connection between all these different things and there are some stories of the black-eyed children smelling either sulfurous or like dirt like the earth and you find those indicated in some direct ways some oblique ways in some of the older fairy stories as well. So yeah, I, I, I think that there is a connection to be made there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what's on your agenda in the months ahead? What do you win with yourself? Well, as someone who has also um, written, you said you've written some fiction too, is that correct? Yeah, I've written psychological thrillers and children's books. But... So, so, so you can commiserate my foolishness and the fact that I am about to release a novel. <laughs> Um, that I, yeah, it's called Them Old Ways Never Died. If you've been listening to this conversation, you probably have an idea of some of the antagonists in it. That's a proof that I got here. Water. That's exciting. Yeah, it's it's all done. 
And, you know, it's simultaneously more and less difficult than working on the nonfiction. It's less, it's less difficult because I tend to, uh, I tend to be very diligent with my citations. So my last book series, Ecology of Souls, had 4,200 endnotes. <laughs> um, yeah. And not having to do that for for a novel is a relief, right. but at the same time, oh, I could read yeah, <laughs> every one, and nobody could tell you you can because it's fiction, <laughs> so. right? But at the same time, you're staring at that blinking cursor on the screen. You're like, this has got to come from me. <laughs> but yeah, you know, a part of it was being sort of a a loose. I would loosely identify myself as as a Jungian who really appreciates the ideas of Carl Jung. I think that his essay on flying saucers is still one of the best things ever written about the UFO phenomenon. But I loosely identifying with Carl Jung, I've I've often parroted this idea, this um, this observation that you know uh, people don't have ideas, ideas have people, and it's a sense that there is this well of archetypes, the collective unconsciousness, just inspiration that's out there that you sort of act as a, a vector for, right? You know, it's some, and I'm sure that you felt this too, like things just sort of come to you out of nowhere. You're like, that's not me. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is, but that's not. No, I, I true. Some, oftentimes I say, I think I feel like somebody's channeling through me that yes, with, yeah. come, I have no, it's like somebody's using me to get what they want out. Yeah, I, I I recently read an interview with Ray Bradbury where he said the same thing. He said, you know, sometimes I go downstairs early in the morning and I, I pick pick one of my books off my shelf and I just sit there and cry because I have no idea where this came from. And so, so I'd always so I'd always said that thing, you know, I'd always said that thing like I I believe that people don't have ideas, ideas have people, but I'd never really experienced it in that way. Mm-hmm. And then I'd talked to enough authors of fiction who had said that they had interacted with their characters and like they would try to make their characters do things and the characters would refuse. And I'm like, this sounds really interesting. Oh, well, yeah. And it, yeah. And honestly, the way that I think like that's in terms of the way that I think and conceptualize these topics, that is a paranormal slash supernatural <laughs> slash numinous experience in and of itself. So I wanted to experience that firsthand. And that's why I sort of embarked on this. So did you? Yeah, I did. And it was really interesting because one of their favorite times to come to me would be between being fully awake and falling asleep. Okay. And I, you know, I thought I'd have to keep a notepad by my desk and write. I really have the pad and the the pen on my nightstand because in the middle, I I will get sentences and paragraphs and I, and I've got, I got to jot them down now and and I'll be like this in the dark because I don't want to wake up my husband just so that I can get it down because I will forget it totally by the morning and it's happened and I've been so pissed off at myself. So I keep <laughs> yes, it yeah. in by bed so it doesn't happen. Yeah, it just evaporates into the ether if you don't. There are a couple of ideas that I like get away like that. Yeah, but it, it's it's uncanny and, and I'm I'm very uh, encouraged to hear that you've experienced the same thing because it's yeah, like you. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know where the verbiage is coming from. It's not typically something that I would I would feel that I'm educated enough or capable enough of doing but it just comes and i'm like thankful for it i'm you know very appreciative for it but like you i don't know where it comes from well and and i don't know if it's you know i don't know if it's i don't know if it's the collective unconscious or i don't know if it's our thoughts taking on a life of their own or i don't know if it's you know some sort of retro causal thing where this thing already exists in the future and it's projecting backwards across time to pull us into making it very clever you know (laughs) <laughs> um, but, but, I, but it does feel like there's an externality to it and I wanted to experience that and I, I got to, and it's the sort of thing yeah. that unless you have experienced it, you can't quite articulate yeah. the profundity yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I'm happy for you that you did because. The... Well, yeah. And, and right in, as I've been fond of saying, well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I did it for myself. So to that extent, I have no expectations for it, but I do have aspirations for it. So we'll see how it's received. If nobody likes it, then I did it for me, and I got to have that experience that we talked about. So exactly, and may, that may be the only reason why you were meant to do it. I mean, right. we, we do things for certain reasons. We have no idea what they are sometimes. So if that's what was meant to happen for that reason, then so be it. But yes. I, I, I don't think that it won't be well received because of what you have behind you already so that about it yeah well I'm, I'm i'm eager to share the the characters with with folks and and yeah it, it ties in a lot of the themes and i get to say some things that i wouldn't normally get to say because you know you can only be 
there's a certain conservatism that you have to employ when writing nonfiction, you know, mm. well, and you can speculate, but you have to address that you're speculating and then make sure that it's clear. So, you know, anyway, I get to, I got to Joe, you're gonna have somebody coming back and saying something to you about something you thought. It. Well, that was my opinion. Uh, yeah, yeah, always. I've experienced. I'm not saying you might experience, but it's from my experience. Yeah, it was really interesting. I um, I gave my one of my first talks was at a uh, MUFON meeting um, down here in Georgia, and it was about that sort of food exchange that I alluded to as being my okay. first book. And there was an experiencer in the front row, and she said, "Well, I've experienced all this stuff all my life, and." And I've never had anybody, any of these things offer any food to me. And I said, I said, I, I respect that. And I acknowledge that that is, I believe you. I said, I've also, I've also driven my entire life and not had a blowout. <laughs> it doesn't mean it doesn't happen, you know? Exactly. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think that. I received that message when you said that. <laughs> she kind of got quiet, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. and yeah, I wasn't trying to be snarky, but you know, I'm just trying to say that you've got to. Snark. To well, yeah. Different the way you say it <laughs> so so yeah um so yeah yeah i think and, and that's something that i keep on trying to bring people back to especially in this era when we've got all these congressional hearings on ufos and they seem to be propping up this military industrial complex thing is that the most important aspect of these encounters does seem to happen at the individual level you know i mean the the stories these phenomena, I don't think, are about sharing with the world or proving anything to the world. I mean, like, I think if you are trying to prove the reality of these things, it's a bit like getting a secret love letter from a lover and going around everybody saying, look, they love me. Look, this person loves me. You know, that's, that's not the purpose of a love letter. You know, what I mean? a love letter is, 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 is an exchange between two people. And it's got, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I sort of think that we we can always use, or should, we should always embrace the opportunity to recenter these phenomena back on the experiencers themselves, because a lot of these things seem tailor made for the people who see them. Um, exactly. Yeah, and I say I say that to a lot of people that follow my books when they receive messages from deceased loved ones. You know, they have people that are turning them. Oh, that that didn't happen. That was just a clown. And I say to them, you don't need to prove anything to anybody. You receive something, and if it's in your mind and your heart that that was your deceased dad or your deceased child, receive it as that. It's your personal experience. Nobody can shut you down. And they can both be right. Like to the to the outside party, it can just be a cloud, and to the person exactly. who's seeing it, it can yeah, it can be something different. I mean. It's, it's similar to similar to dreams, and I think that a lot of this stuff sort of maybe unfolds in this sort of waking dream state. Not to say that I think that it's imaginary, but that rather it's just there's another realm that we access. That's neither here nor there, but you know, you'll have some people come to you with this most profound dream for them, and you're listening to it, and you're, you kind of get bored halfway through. You've had this happen, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's because it's not for you. It wasn't your right. dream, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think that's always important. That's to, to, I'm describing it, though. That was good. Yeah. It, putting it. Yeah. Why don't you please tell the listeners where they can find you, what your website is, and where you get books and stuff. Cause Absolutely. Like it. I'm not on Twitter. I was on Twitter for a while, <laughs> and it just got to be too much. So several years back, I quit Twitter, but, um, you can reach me through my website at Joshua Cutchin.com J O S H U A C U T C H I N.com. Just like a cut on your chin. Um, and there's information about all my books up there and, and also conference appearances, links to all interviews that I do like this one. And I do have a, a presence on Facebook, Joshua Cutchin author. And yeah, if, if you're interested in any of my work, you can uh, go to my website and punish yourself by listening to <laughs> hours upon end of me, of me talking. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> well, I thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. And I'm going to be looking those books up myself. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Ghostly listeners, you can sign up or level up on my author Eleanor Wagner Patreon program. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, where you will find special bonus opportunities only available to its patrons, such as one-on-ones with me and co-hosting opportunities on episodes of Eleanor Wagner's Strange and Scary World podcast. 
Thank you, paranormal enthusiasts, for tuning in today. I hope you'll come back again. Remember to tap into your own gifts. Everyone has them. And in the meantime, make sure you're creeping it real. Thank you.